fishing wasn't in any kind of straight line or official procedure. There wasn't any manual or instructions. There were no reality TV shows about fishing in the Bering Sea or YouTube videos to watch. My family had the right maritime temperament, but no one owned a commercial fishing boat. Nevertheless, arrows pointed me in that direction. Waiting to talk to the right person, I watched asked questions, and had conversations. No one mentioned it might be a bad idea. Instead, I was lucky to run into people who could see that I wanted to know more about the fishing world to see if there might be a place for me. Back home on San Juan Island, I took a shortcut through my neighbor's woods. In the weeds covered with a foot of dead leaves was a 13-foot wooden skiff with a rusted-out motor. It was love at first sight, if that's possible, with an old wooden boat. This old forgotten skiff belonged to our neighbor. I'd known him forever, and though we weren't particularly close, I felt comfortable enough asking him about the old boat out in the woods. I explained how I wanted to fix it up and take it to Alaska hand-trolling. We sat in his pickup truck and he smiled and reminisced that he used to hand troll in Alaska. He lived on a beach and fished out of a skiff somewhere near Point Baker. Take the boat, he said. Be safe. He got me and I got him. I promised to return his boat at the end of the season. We anchored up several hours north of Pelican and Graves Harbor. The bay was just as it had been for the past 10,000 years, since the glaciers had melted off. 
It was close to midnight. In Alaska, the summer sky only dims to lavender. The air was thick with salt. Fog hung in the mountains that rose straight up out of Graves Harbor. I felt like I was part of a landscape from an ancient Chinese scroll. Solitary birds called to each other across the bay. A single unwavering note, one trill, then another note just slightly higher or lower that cut through the heavy marine air. It was as if you could take all of Alaska's wildness and roll all that wild into this one chilling bird note. Each spring, Carl joined the migration north to Alaska to salmon fish and returned each fall to overwinter in the fresh water of Union Bay at Fisherman's Terminal in Seattle. When I started out with my own fishing boat, I looked up to fishermen like Carl. His long career reached back to another time in the fishery, before quotas, before freezer boats, for that matter, before electronics. If he had to, Carl could have navigated anywhere in the fog with only a compass. I met Carl at Fisherman's Terminal, where he kept his salmon troller, the Grace, during the off-season. He wore a gray Woolrich jacket and leather deck shoes, both of which he bought at Seattle Ship Supply, the only store where Carl shopped. His boat was a classic 38-foot double-ender, white with gray trim. The deck was painted deck red. Everything about the grace was ship shape, like Carl. His boat had the kind of elegant lines that would make anyone with the slightest streak of adventure want to drop everything and go salmon fishing in Alaska. I don't remember seeing Carl in greasy work overalls, like every other fisherman at the docks. There wasn't a streak of rust or any paint that needed redoing. The grace never seemed to age. It was as if there was a perfect equilibrium between the boat and Carl. He took care of her and she took care of him. On a day too wet to paint, Carl invited me over for coffee. He asked if I knew how to make the trip north through the inside passage. Down in the forecastle, he unrolled his well-worn charts, charts with coffee stains and his own meticulous notes. He gave me instructions for the journey north, where to anchor, where to wait on weather and tides, and where to catch fish once I made it there. I was grateful for his advice. He'd made the trip many times. This was my first time going to Alaska. The Inside Passage was a legendary route starting in Puget Sound and going up between the coasts of British Columbia and Vancouver Island and north into southeast Alaska. Most of the thousand-mile trip was in protected waters. A couple of sections traversed open ocean, Queen Charlotte Sound and Dixon Entrance. There were anchorages on either side of Queen Charlotte Sound for boats to wait on good weather. Places like God's Pocket, a crummy little anchorage with a great name. The Inside Passage was more than a waterway north. It was part hero's journey, part escape route, part promised land full of pots of gold, 
part end of the line and a long way from civilization. And for fishermen, heading north up the inside passage was the start of the season. In my parents' time, Hansen's handbook, a piloting guide, was still in use. Instructions detailed how far between buoy markers, how many intervals a light blinked, and even 19th century style drawings of what certain passages looked like, which helped mariners find their way. For me, the inside passage was a trail of breadcrumbs left by my parents, a way to communicate with them, though they were gone. It was their invitation north to maritime adventure. <laughs> 